Uh, ladies and gentlemen, apologies uh, for uh, the slight delay in our uh, starting the session. We are about eight minutes uh, behind schedule, uh, but I'm sure uh, you will not regret uh, the delay because we are going to have a, a very live session, live not only in the sense of uh, technology, but also I'm sure some of the issues that we are going to discuss with uh, be very live. And um, so on my own behalf and on behalf of uh, my colleagues, Ajay Gandhi, Amita Desai, and uh, Kinnara Murthy, and the entire HLF team, I thank uh, Mr. Ram Madhav for uh, his time this evening, for joining us this evening as part of our uh, online sessions. Uh, Ram Madhav Garu, we have been doing these sessions since lockdown, once in every 15 days. And uh, so uh, we are very uh, glad that, uh, and we also thank you for uh, taking time out to join us this evening. So without uh, much further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think somebody like Ram Madhav uh, really requires any uh, introduction. We all know him as uh, the former General Secretary of BJP. And of course, uh, uh, much before that, he has been all his life a Pracharak of RSS. And uh, so we all know his uh, assignments uh, in Kashmir, in the Northeast, etc. So. Uh, thank you, Ram Garu, once again. And um, uh, as I said, uh, we are very happy that you have been able to find time uh, to join us this evening. Thank you, Vijay Kumarji. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to be able to you know, join in this online conversation with you and, of course, with all your colleagues uh, in the Hyderabad uh, Literary Festival group. I thank all of you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this evening we are going to talk about this book uh, that has come out recently, uh, Because India Comes First. Uh, this is a collection of uh, 53 um, articles that uh, Ramadev ji has written uh, over a period of, actually, the, the, um, a quick look at the uh, articles that are included here show us that the earliest uh, article was dated 2009 and the latest is uh, 2020. So uh, several articles uh, from these uh, 10 to 11 years uh, are brought together into one volume. So altogether there are 53 um, uh, essays, 53 uh, basically uh, articles, and most of them have been published in uh, Open Magazine. Uh, some of them have also been published in Indian Express um, and uh, so on and so forth. And these 53, uh, articles have been uh, divided into five sections uh, and to each one uh, Ramadev ji gives a, a specific title. Uh, we will obviously not have the time to go into each of those sections, but we will take uh, a few from um, uh, different sections and try to cover the book as much as we can. So Ramadev Garu, first, uh, please tell me, um, uh, you know, what was the purpose of uh, bringing out uh, this uh, book, this collection of essays. Hmm. Now, firstly, uh, although you find a couple of articles dating back to 2009, 2010, 11, and 12, mm -hmm. most of these articles that have been included in this uh, in this publication were uh, from uh, my writings in uh, several papers in the last few years, last four or five years, largely. Yeah. Uh, the school of thought to which I belong has uh, not been represented much through our own channels, through heart's mouth in the mainstream English media. Mm -hmm. Those who uh, do not agree with us or oppose us have always found a lot of space in the, in the medium that uh, I tried to use. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky to get some space in these mainstream uh, publications like the Indian Express, the Hindustan Times, uh, the Open Magazine. And these are all important magazines and they carried some of uh, my writings and uh, out of those writings, some of them have been collected and published in the form of this booklet. Uh, 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 in the form of this book. The idea was that those ideas, which essentially represented the thinking of our uh, you know, organization, our school of thought, should reach a wider audience 
because after all when they are published in uh, certain magazines and papers not everyone gets to you know, read or gets uh, access to them so this publication is uh, intended to see if this uh, collection of these ideas can reach a wider audience i am in that sense lucky that uh, a very uh, prestigious publication like west hand uh, westland which is uh, um, which is the indian uh, uh, group of the amazon group of companies they came forward to publish it they have a wider uh, uh, readership so i thought this would be a good opportunity for me to see if my if the ideas of my organization reach wider audience that's the whole purpose hmm. uh, but uh, isn't it uh, very unusual for a organization like rss to which you belong uh, to go public like this because uh, at least uh, most of us know rss as a very uh, closed uh, organization uh, and uh, mostly i suppose they 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 talk to their own uh, cadres and uh, their own uh, uh, followers uh, rather than be in conversation with uh, of uh, pe- with people who don't uh, agree with them that was true largely in the first 5 6 decades of uh, the rss uh, existence and its growth mm. until uh, i would say until the early 90s what you said used to be the case with the rss we mostly used to communicate uh, within we used to you know preach to the converted mm. uh, we used to be a very reticent organization when it came to engaging with uh, the public outside especially with those who do not agree with us mm. uh, some of us uh, within the organization definitely felt that there is uh, i mean time has come for this organization Uh, to reach out to the larger audience but also engage with those who do not agree with us uh, on every issue you know there will be issues on which uh, some people will agree some may not agree with us not everybody is ideologically motivated to oppose it oppose us for the sake of opposition hmm. after all people have their own thinking their own intellect they assess the ideas on the on the basis of their merit but the important thing is that we should start reaching out so this process has started in rss sometime in the middle of uh, 1990s when the rss uh, started this uh, department called the prachar vibhag mm-hmm. and the spokesperson as an interface of the rss with the wider uh, society wider community uh, as an institution came into existence in the year 2000 mm-hmm. incidentally i happened to be the second spokesperson of the rss first was uh, a very highly respected senior leader of rss mr mg vaidya mm-hmm. i succeeded him in year 2001 that was when i shifted from my base from hyderabad to delhi and i became the uh, spokesperson for the rss that's how the rss actually started engaging with uh, wider uh, public uh, you know wider sections of the public and started articulating its views uh, publicly uh, that is how this whole thing has uh, happened i mean today you can't say that rss uh, continues to be an inward looking organization it is today engaging more and more with uh, wider public in fact rss chief spends a lot of time reaching out to uh, eminent persons in the public life it has become an integral part of the rss activity now hmm. uh, but uh, uh, you know it's it's all right for you to Uh, say that it has changed and uh, you actually you have a chapter in the book called glass nost uh, mm-hmm. but can a tiger really change its stripes no uh, see it, uh, i mean uh, uh, we, uh, when you call somebody a tiger or a lion or something else in what context you are saying is important the tiger also should not be misunderstood by people uh, as uh, as uh, something else some other animal mm. um, uh, 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 i mean tiger should be understood as tiger <laughs> tiger stripes should not be misunderstood for some other animal <laughs> i mean whatever you are yes. you have to be uh, presenting yourself to the wider public you should not camouflage yourself or you should not hide yourself Uh, that is uh, very essential for an organization like the rss and rss is increasingly doing that mm-hmm. which is uh, very important because rss after all uh, while it has uh, 
a uh, uh, number of detractors in the public life you and i should not forget that rss today has uh, millions and millions of followers also yes they are also thinking people so it has wide spectrum of supporters but there are a good number of uh, people who probably misunderstand it or probably don't uh, support the ideas in either case it is time it has to engage with them to present itself uh, uh, in its own way yeah uh the reason why i mentioned uh, you know the rss and its uh, uh, essential behavior is because your very first chapter of the book uh, talks about um, uh, you were uh, i don't know if it is a kind of a discomfiture but you seem to feel a little um constrained uh, after entering politics because you say that um, whereas in uh, the organization Uh, you were uh, told that ideology is everything and uh, everything was clear black and white but when you entered the politics you realized uh, you know that politics is really the art of the possible and uh, so do you really feel um, what should i say you feel comfortable in this uh, new role because after all you know you are a, you are an rss man on loan to bjp uh, so how do you see these two uh, in a roles uh, of uh, of viewers uh, vijay kumar ji rather than making it subjective to my own uh, involvement in politics it's actually a very important question that all of us should ask today mm. whether the kind of politics that we we practice today or we all face today mm. is it uh, okay with us to carry on our dream? do we really need uh, to think seriously about the kind of politics that is practiced uh, in our country especially but uh, no looking at the events that are happening elsewhere also we need to seriously look about look, look at the whole uh, question of politics as far as i am concerned i you are very right i came from a different background uh, where we were driven more by idealism i really in fact i think i have written about it also in one of my articles i never uh, i never used the word ideology because i always believed that ideology is a closed uh, frame of thoughts a genuine thinking person should always be open you, sh- you should not be in any closed frame of thoughts so in that sense i only use the word idealism we are driven by a certain kind of idealism which we believe that in fact my book's title uh, is what we i always feel india should come first so whatever we do our nation our country our people should come first you entered you enter the politics with that kind of a training and that kind of a mindset and suddenly here you find yes india comes first but when elections come your party comes first hmm. so there is definitely a dichotomy when it comes to forming the government your party should come first your government should come first the managing that dichotomy is certainly a challenge for people who of course come from outside like us Mm. uh yeah it's it's a learning experience for me in the last 6 years i wrote yeah. that article also with lots of constraints i know <laughs> i can see that in fact uh, the uh, the uh, the articles that are uh, that are part of the first uh, section of the book you know they all to me at least they all seem to have uh, a kind of a very what should i say ironical tone because uh, whatever you are saying uh in those first um, you know section of the articles many of them actually seem to talk about in a way your own party you know about what kind of politics we should uh, have etc etc and of course you are taking a very broad view you are not talking about any one particular party but uh, you know issues like you know democracy etc uh, but since you mentioned uh, the title of the book uh, let me begin by asking you what exactly do you mean by because india comes first india comes first uh, who is your intended uh, you know uh, person that you are talking about is it india should come first for individuals uh, for parties for uh, citizens for uh, policy makers i mean to whom are you directing this um, title because india comes first the the, the... Uh, i mean those who are uh, involved in shaping the future of this country mm-hmm. whether it is those in politics like some of us and many of us are also in power 
some of us are not in power we are also not in power in many places like in telangana we are not in power we are in the opposition wherever we are then besides that intellectuals like you you are all for all of us uh, the bottom line should be india sh- should come first in that uh, i mean i appreciate your observation that uh, even uh, many things we as a party we as a movement also have to you know reconsider we have to probably restate many of our positions mm. for example i have uh, extensively written about gandhi mm. but what is the general perception outside about rss and gandhi yes generally the perception is that we are anti gandhi mm. which we are not so uh, i mean even within the organization somebody thinks that uh, rss is anti gandhi he also should understand that no that's not the case mm. why we take up those on issues maybe we are disagree on issues we have differences with uh, gandhi ji on uh, several issues but when it comes to looking at the larger national interest we have to uh, appreciate the role played by every uh, big leader in this country so in that sense india comes first should be uh, uh, a mantra for everybody in public life mm. whether it is insiders or outsiders in fact that's why the there is one full chapter yeah uh, on uh, the the uh, the thinking within mm. yeah in fact uh, the um, you know i have marked this uh, passage in uh, the essay which uh, from which the the title comes because india comes first and uh, where you say uh, that you want to give an alternative vision right um, you know he say you say that um, Uh, in modi and uh, the bjp the people of this country have seen not only an alternative government to the disastrous one headed by the congress but an alternative vision to and uh, it is that vision uh, that you wanted to uh, write about so i wanted to ask you what is this vision and uh, how is this vision different from uh, the the vision that you are opposed to and why where does this vision come from i mean what is the source of this this vision okay it's a very big question uh, but uh, let me try to put it uh, as succinctly as possible you see when uh, we uh, became independent when we began our uh, journey as an independent nation uh, we could not resolve one important issue that was whether india was a nation or not the result was that we we began by uh, our constitution by stating that we the people of india we did not call india a nation there and even while defining india in uh, article 1 of our constitution we only called it as a union of states now there was a lot of discussion in the constituent assembly those interested can really look into the discussion about uh, whether we should call india as a nation of india or people of india interesting discussion so somewhere uh, this very question of india's national identity could not be resolved at the time of our independence but if you look at our movement right from day one we have been articulating a vision of india's national identity we call it rashtriyata we call it hindutva we have our own way of presenting it but at least we are clear that india is a nation with that as our with that in the background we have always envisioned a nation which would be prosperous which would progress on a on a on a, on a different course that vision was not the same that others who ruled over this country in the last 6 uh, 7 decades shared with us because they began from the point that india was just a people it was still not a nation uh, we have to make a nation out of these people that's why that famous you know statement a nation in the making uh, came into vogue in early 50s nehru very frequently used to use that phrase we are a nation in the making so that is where where i say we start from a slightly different position that india as an ancient nation with a definite value system a big culture that culture which unites this country which gives uh, unity of this country so from that benchmark we have to you know 
build our country, take it forward. So that's what I say, we have a different vision. So those people which have that vision could secure a complete support from the people of the country in, terms of, in, the, in the form of a majority. That's why I said, now with that vision, we are moving forward. Yeah, but Ramadevji, where does this vision come from? I mean, what is, as I said, what is the source of this vision? Because, uh, you know, you mentioned Nehru uh, talking about uh, that we are a people and not yet a nation. And uh, similarly, uh, Ambedkar also says that uh, in his, uh, you know, 1949 uh, address, last uh, address to the Constituent Assembly, he says that we are a country, but are, you know, we are not yet a nation. So it, it is not just Nehru uh, who had that kind of a uh, statement, but also Ambedkar. And also, in a way, if uh, whatever um, uh, you said, six decades of uh, rule that has happened, uh, their vision, at least let us say their vision, uh, they claim, whether you agree with, or, with that or not, they claim uh, comes from the constitution of India. So where does your vision come from? No, constitution, of course, is not somebody's, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's not a partial document. It's not for somebody and it's not, uh, it doesn't belong to somebody else. It's not that way. Constitution is for all of us. It's our, uh, you know, modern day Veda for us. Every citizen has to respect the constitution and simply abide by it. Uh, uh, you know, even Nehru, if you read uh, his uh, letters to uh, Indira Gandhi from J uh, from the prison, mm -hmm. or if you read the book, uh, his Discovery of India, he very beautifully articulates that same vision that I am talking about today. Mm -hmm. That India as an ancient nation with a great civilization, uh, an ancient civilization with a great culture, cultural and uh, civilizational identity and all that, he articulated in an excellent way in uh, his writings. Uh, whether it is letters or, uh, or this discourse of India and all these things. And even Ambedkar, for that matter. Yes, you are right. In the Constituent Assembly, he made this argument that, uh, you know, somehow we lack national consciousness in this country. We only have caste consciousness. That's the point he tried to, you know, highlight. That unless we overcome this caste consciousness and develop that sense of nation, uh, nation uh, identity, nationhood, uh, you cannot simply call it uh, a nation. That was his uh, position at that time. But even he used to say that nationalism is a civil, uh, is a spiritual idea, which we all say. Now you asked about the source of our vision of nationalism. It comes from India's age-old civilizational and cultural history, which is uh, several millennia old, which was the thing referred to by Nehru when he wrote that discourse of India, which even Dr. Ambedkar meant when he said it's a spiritual idea, nationalism is a spiritual idea. So we draw our vision from that India's age-old civilizational and cultural experience. Yeah, but uh, uh, Ramadavji, if uh, we make a distinction between uh, what you are talking about is something that we all uh, in a very general way talk about as patriotism. Uh, and, uh, you know, because, uh, again, some, somebody whom you, um, your uh, party has been, um, in a way, uh, invoking these days, um, you know, R Rabindranath Tagore, uh, constantly he, he wrote many essays uh, opposing this whole idea of nationalism, uh, whereas he said, of course, patriotism is something different from nationalism. But the way in which you are defining uh, nationalism is, you know, you're talking about ancient civilizational history and, uh, you know, the, the similarities, civilizational um, affinity, right? Uh, whereas if we are talking about nation, it's a much more a modern nation. I mean, modern concept in a way, you know, originating in the 19th century with a very, with a very bloody history uh, to it. So, uh, are we, are we just talking about two different concepts being merged into one, patriotism as, as well as nationalism? No, not really. <laughs> Actually, we all very conveniently quote Ravindranath Tagore, I know. But you also know the context. In, he has not written many essays for that matter. There was only one essay in which he challenged the idea of nationalism. That was immediately after the First World War. The very point that you are making, that nationalism had led to bloody battles, bloody wars, 
in 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 the west in europe especially so in that context after the first world war he did criticize the european idea of nationalism no doubt but then mahatma gandhi talked so much about nationalism in this country mahatma gandhi is nationalism he said for me nationalism means ram rajya how do you take it then so we should take it as in the indian context what is their view even ravindranath tagore spoke so much about india civilizational and cultural identity and its uh, as the basis of india's unity he he says this is what bharat mata stands for ravindranath tagore was a quintessential indian nationalist hmm. he did he did criticize the european idea of nationalism which had led to two big world wars two great wars and you know deaths of 1 uh, uh, million people so that should not be seen as rejection of nationalism per se by rabindranath tagore rabindranath tagore was one of the freedom fighters who fought for this country it's uh, it's revival and they one of those great leaders who always believed that india as a as a civilizational nation is a very ancient one so i don't think really uh, there is any big contradiction between his thinking rabindranath tagore's thinking or for that matter gandhi ji's ideas and what uh, we believe today and if somebody wants to use the word patriotism no harm i mean what we are calling as nationalism is not definitely the same as what europe experienced as nationalism definitely not and if somebody wants to say it is patriotism one can call it patriotism but then i can give you 10 examples of how patriotism also turned uh, into a kind of a most dangerous animal take the case of japan mm-hmm. japanese yeah. patriotism had led to massive human rights violations against countries like china countries like korea so it's not about the word it's about what you do with that word which is important in our case whether you call it nationalism patriotism fine okay um one of the things uh, that uh, uh, if we take the entire section 1 as a whole uh, you seem to be a little uh, apprehensive about uh, democracy being automatically a, a, a good form of government uh, because you constantly refer to um, illiberal democracies uh, and uh, and in fact say that uh, if some countries in the middle east are given democracy uh, they would uh, posthumously elect uh, osama bin laden as uh, their uh, leader so and uh, there are several instances in different essays where you seem to uh, say uh, that uh, democracy need not be uh, what should i say a little you are little apprehensive about uh, democracy so uh, what what would be your response to that no first of all we all must agree vijay kumar ji that there is no one democracy there are democracies in the world there are democracies like that of uh, our country india which are very vibrant here people are the real masters they can put you in power they can pull you down any 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 time they want there are such very successful democracies we have been a successful democracy for last seven decades but not many countries are so fortunate there are countries which are democracies but i don't want to go on naming them and then the, uh, not to i don't want to displease anybody but uh, um, even china for that matter you ask anybody in china they will say we have our own democracy because there is a system of electing leaders but they have to be from one party mm-hmm. so uh, democracy there is no one democracy in the entire world there are different various forms of democracies some are liberal some are illiberal this illiberal statement i am not making today every renowned political scientist talks about it the illiberal element that is creeping into certain democracies um, you know is a is a cause for concern especially today i mean in the covid and post covid era you see rise of uh, certain uh, uh, you know certain leaders who are uh, using democratic authority to become authoritarian leaders that is also happening yeah them democracies they are not dictatorships they are democracies only i don't i i, I can name those countries but i don't know if it is fair i mean uh, you have seen countries like hungary what happened there yeah. using democratic powers one can uh, try to become more authoritarian so democracy as a, that's why i mean in fact at one place i wrote when nehru was asked he said democracy is the second best form of governance then naturally he was asked then what is the best form he said yet to be invented mm. 
the best model we yet to invent but available best model is democracy it has its own shades i'm neither neither opposed to democracy nor skeptical about it but if you simply turn uh, um, a blind eye to uh, the illiberal tendencies that grow in democracy that is uh, harmful for the very idea of democracy yeah but uh, um, you i mean since you we are on the topic of democracy you seem to make a distinction between uh, individual rights and group rights and um, uh, you say that you know very often everybody is talking about individual rights but uh, groups also should, you know have their rights and uh, therefore uh, so is is that uh, a little illiberal i mean if i say that no 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 not really not really uh, let me tell you then since you mm. you are distinguishing between these two issues uh, when uh, the human rights charter was being made in 1946 letters were sent out to many leaders one letter was sent to mahatma gandhi also uh, asking him to recommend the required fundamental human rights for the mankind irrespective of uh, countries and forms of government gandhi's reply was i come from a background where i don't recognize this question of uh, fundamental rights itself his reply was that we only believe in duties he was trying to put duties first then he writes once i perform my duty rights of the other person are automatically protected that doesn't mean he became illiberal it that doesn't make gandhi illiberal it is a statement that we are making that while individual rights are important the rights as the as a community as a nation are also equally important so when it comes to a clash between these two the indian civilizational uh, civilizational uh, you know ex- teaching has always been that uh, you will always hold uh, the uh, rights of the nation rights of the community as uh, supreme and superior hmm. but uh, uh, ramadev ji you also uh, write more than once in the book uh, that uh, basically governance is a kind of a pact between the people and the government and uh, you seem to uh, be worried about the fact that uh, people who are neither uh, in power nor uh, uh, you know directly affected by it uh, seem to be hijacking the agenda uh, and you give the example of uh, sabarimala and you say that um, uh, the, the 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 petition in the courts were filed by people who are you know declared themselves as non believers so my question is is it really the responsibility of only those who are directly affected by something that they should uh, they should raise their voice i mean are we not uh, collectively responsible uh, even if i am not personally you know affected by it don't i have the responsibility to re- you know to respond to something that has happened to somebody else Uh, i was trying to draw the attention to this very important fact that you are referring to yeah see we are entering into an era of heteropolarity yes what is heteropolarity i tell you mm-hmm. one earlier the poles used to be the governments in the world today hyderabad litfest can become a pole mm. it can get into anything and everything and even you by your argument it can go and argue that why not people enter american congress and destroy the uh, room of the speaker because even if i am not directly uh, involved in that process I, as a citizen i have a right this kind of argument can lead you to anywhere and those groups are rising that is a reality today so the conventional stakeholders hmm. conventionally those who are supposed to be stakeholders sir they are not the only ones anymore today today uh, a facebook has become very powerful it can dictate uh, the uh, functioning of governments in the world today social media multinational companies tech giants today ngos one jan soros can uh, make an announcement that um, i will uh, I, i will spend uh, some so many billions of dollars to you know dethrone narendra modi yeah. i mean lone wolves so we are entering into that kind of an era i was cautioning that you know today these democracies face the situation where heteropolarity is the reality they have the right or not 
this liberal uh, this liberal constitution gives right to everybody that is the reason why they went to the supreme court but my point is we are faced with that situation where you are a non believer you have nothing to do with it but you say that no 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 i am protecting the rights of so and so but don so and so is saying no i don't want that right you are in such a very dichotomous situation that's what i am saying yeah but i think it is in this context uh, you know there is already a very colorful vocabulary that has been uh, you know invented uh, uh, for people who disagree with you you know urban naxals and uh, all these and you seem to have added one more word to <laughs> no 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 vijay kumar by, ji you know, you, uh, using you know uh, mombatti walas no 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 vijay kumar ji all this while this uh, branding of people has been the right of all of you you used to call us communalist you used to call us fascist you used to call us hitlerians today we are turning back and telling a few things to you now you are uncomfortable this goes no, no, on i'm not being uncomfortable <laughs> but this ramadev ji you know you, you are very sarcastic yeah. about you know mombatti wala because you are so much worried about mombatti wala today all the while you are the people who have been calling us communalists hmm. what was that branding all about Mm. when i call you names that is fine if somebody else calls me names that becomes a big constitutional issue mm. these are public discourses where people use those things i i personally never like to use any pejorative term against anybody even if it is an ideological adversary mm. but in a free country you say that people who do not have any locus standi can also go up to supreme court and argue the cases that you say but in the same way you give that freedom to people who blame others uh, the way they want to blame contest them tell them that you, you, what you are saying is wrong yeah i think uh, uh, ramadev ji two uh, obviously two important issues uh, that uh, that dominate your section 2 uh, which actually deal with uh, the nuts and bolts issues of uh, governance uh, one is of course um, kashmir and uh, article 370 and um, you probably you have written uh, the longest essay in the book uh, on uh, article 370 uh, but some of those arguments it looked to me that you are trying to defend the indefensible uh, because uh, you have been uh, very very what should i say economical with uh, with uh, with facts uh, for example i i just uh, randomly if you say uh you mentioned many of these very emotional uh, issues as a justification for uh, you know uh, abrogation of 370 for example you said uh, no outsider can buy land uh, in uh, in kashmir and that is preventing the development of the state but that is also true of uh, himachal pradesh that is also true of nagaland uh, and uh, so they are you know again similarly you say that um, women of kashmir Uh, who marry outside lose their inheritance again uh, already to i think uh, in 2002 or something the jnk high court has already said that that will not apply right in terms of development you say that you know it is de- it is under developed kashmir is not developing because uh, it is not fully integrated in into india but again if you see the various indexes uh, of kashmir right uh in social index health index literacy index right life expectancy right um many of them are actually uh, better than many other states uh, in india right uh, for example i can give examples of bihar i can examples of uttar pradesh i can give example of uh, you know for example a young girl marrying uh, before the age of uh, legal age of marriage that is much lower in kashmir compared to gujarat right so on many of these indexes uh, the argument that uh, you know uh, kashmir is suffering because uh, this special status was given to it development is not taking place etc they would, they don't seem to stand on uh, you know the and uh, these are all uh, facts taken from the government uh, sources Right. okay now yeah. that you have asked a long question allow me for a long answer okay. also <laughs> number 1 uh, if uh, by allowing outsiders to purchase land you want to cite you want to compare jammu and kashmir with uttarakhand or himachal for a very long time we have been telling our friends in jammu and kashmir the same thing 
can we make you can we abrogate 370 and bring you under 371 Mm -hmm. 371 is a totally different article, Vijay Kumar. Yes, you yes, should yes. understand constitution carefully. Certain rights that come under 370 and 371 are two different things. Fair enough. Now, about women you mentioned, I will tell you the, what is the fact. Now, you are quoting 2002 or 2003 High Court judgment. I tell you what was that judgment all about after a long fight by the women of Jammu and Kashmir. Originally, the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir uh, stated that women, if they marry outside of the state, they will forfeit the state subject status. Now, it was not applicable to men, you know, in, in Jammu and Kashmir, right from uh, leaders of Hurriyat to many men, marry women from Saudi Arabia, women from Dubai, women from America, women from uh, uh, Pakistan. They won't lose, forfeit their citizenship. Whereas if women marry, they will lose. Then a lot of fight happened. People went to court. Both people in Jammu, Hindus, as well as Muslims, both went to the court. Finally, High Court said, all right, women will continue to enjoy the, uh, the status of state subject. But the children of those women will not automatically become state subjects. Only the state subject status is limited to women, even if they marry outside the state. Now, this is the kind of uh, uh, built-in, uh, you know, illegality in the system because of 370. Now, you are uh, talking about development. Let me tell you, for your information, you are in Hyderabad. You have hundreds of private engineering colleges. Do you know that there is not a single engineering college in Jammu Kashmir, Kashmir Valley, private engineering college? There is not a single, uh, you know, private medical college. There is no Medanta. There is no, uh, you know, AIG, no private medical hospital there. Everything dependent on government. Nobody wants to go. It, development is not just about certain indicators. It's about overall development of the people, economic. Otherwise, industry has to grow, uh, you know, economic activity grow. None of these things was happening primarily because Jammu and Kashmir, had a separate constitution. Right? That constitution has been done away with. Mm -hmm. Now, every right that people in Telangana are enjoying, Jammu and Kashmir people are also enjoying. Why should anyone object to it? If any rights are denied, then I can understand that by removing 370, you are denying certain rights. On the contrary, the scheduled caste people in that state who went from Uttar Pradesh, since you referred to Uttar Pradesh, people who went from Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, the scheduled caste people, they have been living in Jammu and Kashmir since 1950s and 60s. They were called there as, uh, you know, Safai Karmacharis. Yes. And uh, they were not provided state subject status. No, they have been living there for 40, 50 years. Their children cannot get uh, treatment in a medical hospital, government hospital. They cannot join in any government job, in any government college. This is the kind of discrimination that is being practiced in that state. That's the reason why that was uh, that 370 was removed. There is absolutely no dearth of facts in what I have said. They are all based on very clear facts. Uh, correct, Ramadavji. You know, Article uh, 370 actually, you know, uh, seems to be made too much uh, out of. Because uh, ultimately, I think uh, it has been hollowed out from inside. Uh, because uh, although you know we say that it has given a special status, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, most of the union you know items in the union list are already applicable in Kashmir. Then, then Vijay Kumarji, then none of you should have any objection to our removing it. No, <laughs> if no, it no, already hollowed out, why do you want to have an empty bottle on the table? Do you keep an empty bottle on the table? You simply remove it. We removed no, it. There, there have been views that uh, actually, uh, you know, what you uh, in, a, in a different article you call a, a kind of a perceptional uh, change. Because I think uh, because it was definitely, uh, you know, high on your agenda, because I think ultimately on the ground, uh, many of the things that you are uh, are already applicable in, uh, you know, for example, you said uh, RTI, right? Uh, I mean, education is already free uh, in Kashmir. Um, and similarly, I think a, a large number of uh, items in the concurrent list are already applicable in uh, JNK, right? So I think it's mostly, I think it is uh, perception that, uh, you know, you, you, you call it a very major uh, you know uh, decision that was taken all right but i think ultimately on the ground I, it, that doesn't really seem to make a much of a difference 
uh, I think it is making a lot of difference to the lives of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, you know, this perception that we are different, we are special. Mm -hmm. That uh, that was being, uh, you know, uh, bred through articles like Article 370 and 35A. Uh, their removal will generally send us, you know, this is not just about people in Jammu and Kashmir, Vijay Kumar, Jerumamba. In the entire country, even the rest of the country used to think that it's a special category state. Now we all feel that we are all equal. Now the people from Telangana, people from Tamil Nadu, people from Karnataka also should feel that uh, it is like, you know, just as you go to Gujarat or Rajasthan, you should also go to Jammu and Kashmir like, uh, like any other state. That kind of uh, uh, emotional integration uh, has to happen. That's the whole purpose behind removing uh, this article. That's why always, uh, I, 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 in fact, I wrote in one of these articles that when we talk about Kashmir, you know, in RSS and in the ABVP, we used to have a slogan, uh, Jammu Kash uh, Kashmir Hamara hai, wo Kashmir Hamara hai, jo Sara ka Sara hai. The entire Kashmiri lovers. Mm. What do we mean by that? Is it the land that we are talking about? No, when we say Kashmiri lovers, we are talking about 11, 12 million Kashmiris. They are ours. With that approach, we are handling the uh, handling the affairs of the state. The entire country also has to approach Kashmir with that sense. Today, Kashmir is integrated with the rest of the country fully. Doesn't mean it's just about its geography. It's about its people. Yes, there are still people who do not agree with us, who have complaints against us, but then we have to reach out to them, tell them that no, remaining one with the rest of the country is in your interest. That's what we are trying to do. That's what every citizen should do. Do you think the recent um, um, elections and the, the victory of uh, the Gupkar Alliance, uh, do you think that uh, they have rejected uh, this argument? Uh, I really don't think that uh, the uh, votes that Gupkar secured can be seen as rejection of, uh, uh, you know, this whole uh, transformation that was put in uh, place there. For one important reason that within Gupkar itself, there are different voices. Gupkar is not a very homogeneous group. And you probably already, if you are following what is happening in, uh, in Kashmir Valley, uh, Gupkar is now imploding. Hmm. There are a lot of inner internal contradictions. The simple reason is there are different views. See, one radical extreme view is held by Mehbuba Mufti. There is a moderate view that Sajad Ron holds. There is a much more moderate view that Farooq Abdullah and Omar Abdullah hold. So there are all shades of opinion. So Gupkar as a group doesn't represent anything. Now only common agenda for Gupkar is statehood to be restored. On that, the government of India is always open. If, if you, the mandate is for, rest, for restoration of statehood, we say welcome. It can be easily, it can be definitely welcomed. Uh, that's an important statement that you are making, Ram Madhav Ji, that, uh, uh, that that issue is still open, is it? That it can well, be restored, the statehood... Uh... Uh, Union Home Minister had himself stated it on the floor of the house that uh, at an appropriate time, the statehood uh, will be restored. So that's it, it was his own statement. Yeah, uh, since you mentioned the Home Minister Ram Madhav Ji, uh, I think another very explosive issue that has uh, troubled the entire nation is obviously the CAA and uh, the NRC. Uh, and uh, uh, on the one hand, the Prime Minister said that there was no discussion about NRC, uh, whereas um, you know, Home Minister, the Home Minister himself uh, said, you know, talked about, uh, and it was there in your um, manifesto, uh, you know, that uh, the entire country will have an NRC. So, and of course, uh, your party president, uh, Nadaji, also spoke about uh, that. Uh, so, uh, are different people speaking in different voices uh, about uh, NRC, for example? And that is one question. And the second is, I mean, since we, are, uh, we seem to be running out of time, very quick question. Where was the need to make um, a religion as a, a criteria for uh, granting uh, um, in CAA, right? Why is it that only uh, three countries and uh, six um, ethnic groups or religious groups were mentioned 
and uh, why did religion become the criteria for uh, granting um, amnesty or no not really it's actually a complete misunderstanding about caa uh, india citizenship act does not discriminate anybody on the basis of religion this citizenship amendment act is not the act per se it's an amendment to the act by which we have fast tracked granting of citizenship to certain sections of the persecuted minorities no persecuted minorities from the neighborhood when they come to india they need not wait like all other citizens for full 12 years they can claim and secure citizenship in 6 to 7 years time that's all we made in citizenship amendment act where is the question of denying citizenship to any other religion if any other religion person if he is not a persecuted minority if he comes to india he is entitled to citizenship he will take it our constitution two things we must remember vijay kumar ji two big mis propaganda that is going on number one is we are denying citizenship to people of some particular religion which is an utterly false statement Uh, we gave citizenship to many muslims from pakistan that famous singer from uh, the bollywood yeah. he secured citizenship and all that number two this propaganda that we are going to uh, remove the citizenship of uh, millions of indian muslims is totally fa- total falsehood because there is no provision in indian citizenship laws to remove your citizenship when there is no provision how can we remove so these are all based on false propaganda nrc was a supreme court directed activity we did not do that in 2013 when upa was in power supreme court had issued a uh, and had issued a verdict stating that nrc should be completed in Jamo, in assam which we completed number 2 caa is not a discriminatory act it's all mischievous propaganda no then in that case why did it mention certain religions why did no, it not say because, because for example for example uh, ramadev ji uh, would would it uh, be open to let us say ahmadiyas from uh, pakistan and rohingyas from myanmar no this, this is a this is a, no first of all this uh, this particular act is applicable only to bangladesh pakistan and afghanistan it doesn't apply to myanmar number one no the, you are asking about myanmar somebody else may ask about uh, afghan uh, somebody else may ask about iran why only myanmar yes i mean yes. persecution can happen anywhere now this particular amendment is limited to these three countries because there is a historical backlog the other thing that vijay kumar ji all must remember is this amendment is not prospective means those who came after 2014 are not are not eligible to take any benefit out of it before 2014 those persecuted minorities who came from these particular neighborhood countries there was an influx this influx happened not during our tenure when the congress was in power other parties were in power this influx happened they are remaining like citizens of stateless citizens they can fast track their citizenship only that much if you came on 2015 first january you are not entitled for this so this is neither discriminatory nor any selectively for any particular group it is a facilitation of fast tracking of citizenship but ramadev ji in uh, in uh, your own uh, article you gave a very wonderful definition of uh, you know what minorities are a minority is not defined numerically it refers to those whose voice has been taken away discrimination on the basis of sex caste or race even in the name of social character is against indic thought so yeah that is indic thought but right. indian constitution you uh, know not constitution in fact very interestingly vijay kumar you have asked a very very interesting question you know any number of rtis to government our government and the previous governments to define minorities even now you can file an rti asking government to define minorities the reply you will get is we don't have any definition in india there is no definition to minorities yet we have minorities religious and linguistic minorities what uh, what constitution talks about but there are specific uh, uh, categories of groups of people in countries mentioned bangladesh pakistan and afghanistan who are treated as minorities those minorities are entitled for this particular uh, you know fast tracking benefit in uh, under caa now if any other group 
also wants that benefit certainly you know now that you mentioned earlier that anybody can go to supreme court claiming uh, uh, for rights of anybody else let somebody go and ask for the rights of ahmadiyas also maybe that can be considered what is wrong in that mm-hmm. so you are saying that it is not limited to the six religions that are mentioned in uh, ca right now ca is limited to six religions but Why? if you want amendment to it if you want more religions to be included you can always go to the government Hmm. but to say that giving it to six minorities itself is wrong is what i am saying is not correct hmm. uh, you want uh, more religions go ahead <laughs> yeah i think if if uh, if the religions were not mentioned and if you say that any you know as you yourself have defined it anybody whose voice has been uh, suppressed and if you say that uh, you know it is open for uh, uh, people who are uh, victims of uh, persecution would that not have been more inclusive rather than mentioning Six. no for writing for writing an article that would have been a very good way of writing an article mm-hmm. but when you are actually making a constitutional amendment you have to define each word when you say it is persecuted minorities the statute has to define who they are mm-hmm. that is where the names of these uh, certain groups including christians including uh, sikhs including uh, jains uh, hindus and all those are mentioned and uh, yeah you are right if amdeya have to be included they can uh, there can be a requisition to the government hmm. uh, ramadev ji let me see if uh, we have uh, some um, questions from the audience um, um one question is that um, a nation in making seems to uh, open to changes considering diverse cultures in india ancient to modern if the vision begins with india is already a nation then how is there a space for plurality this is akanksha who is asking this i think that is one of the questions that has been raised by many people uh, ramadev ji that uh, uh, you know the entire ideology of uh, whether it is rss bjp etc is everything is one you know one nation one flag one ration card etc etc does that go against the very grain of uh, the plural plurality uh, which is the spirit of india no plurality is the nationhood of our country yes you remember see plurality exists everywhere if you drive a car mm. it a car has multiplicity of uh, you know varied parts uh, all of them but they all come together to make a car mm. that doesn't mean plurality is the reality plurality is the reality definitely but as long as there is a car so in the indian sense of nationhood this plurality is a reality it is not something that we reject or we abhor hmm. as far as indian nationhood is concerned which is i said very ancient civilizational nationhood it always believed in the principle that uh, you know pinde pinde matir bhinna i mean in each mind yes. there can be different ideas ekam sat vipraha bauda vadanti let uh, wise men uh, interpret in different ways like we are doing today you and i are uh, saying different things but we are actually talking about the same truth that has been the tradition of this country so plurality and india's nation idea are not uh, mutually exclusive or contradictory they are one and the same um there is one more question um um uh uh, uh uh this is sharada balaji who is asking a nation already made could still be plural uh, why does it exi- uh, uh, why does it exclude uh, plurality um i think uh, geeta reddy is asking the socio economic fabric of india is one of the most multicultural in the world but plurality is a construct of vested interest driven by divisive politics intent on in balkanization of uh, the country so geeta reddy seems to agree with you that this whole idea of plurality is uh, a kind of an artificial construct no plurality uh, as a stand alone idea mm. does not work in a country of so much diversity in this country the plurality the diversity of this land must be respected must be protected and preserved but mm-hmm. there is an overarching unifying thread that uh, passes through this plurality that unifying thread also needs to be always kept intact it has to be strengthened that uh, 
that unifying thread is also equally important as the plurality or diversity of this uh, of this country so in that sense plurality yes diversity yes but as long as it is the part of that overarching unity of the land that has been the life of this country for over so many millennia and where is it that there is no plurality no uh, forget about nation take one state is it uh, just homogeneous there is so much diversity there yet do you not call it as telangana state hmm. or should we now make karimnagar state and nizamabad state and adilabad state no we have multiple identities they are of course they all respect the diversity but we create certain unifying identity also in fact that is a nation since you mentioned nehru uh, more than once Uh, this is exactly what uh, nehru also says although nehru may not be your uh, you know favorite uh, leader um, uh, nehru also says the same thing in uh, in the discovery of india you know he talks about how india is like a garland of uh, different colored uh, flowers uh, which we see the difference but uh, they are all you know in the, in a garland and the the thread that connects all of them is invisible but never absent absolutely so when you look at uh, a garland with uh, uh, various hues uh, flowers of various hues various colors and various fragrances don't just think only about flowers but think about the garland and the thread that runs uh, through all those flowers that's uh, whether it is nehru or we are this is the ancient wisdom of this country that's why what i'm trying to say we always uh, respected the plurality respected diversity but we also believe that there is an innate unity that keeps all of us as one people one society and one nation thank you very much uh, ram madhav ji i think that's a wonderful note to end uh, this conversation uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, we are very uh, happy that you found the time to talk to us uh, this evening and uh, so on my own behalf and on behalf of uh, the entire hyderabad literary festival team and the audience who have joined us and they, actually there are many comments which uh, i don't have the time to uh, go through but uh, thank you very much uh, once again and uh, we 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 hope that uh, uh, although you say that uh, propaganda has uh, denied you a chance i think now you are taking your revenge uh, <laughs> and <laughs> and you you see and uh, therefore i think uh, it's time that we Uh, also i think you that this something that we need to understand that each of uh, you know different few points need to engage with each other uh, so that we can actually find the commonalities rather than the differences um thank you vijay kumar ji it was a really very uh, enthralling kind of uh, conversation uh, we had uh, for almost one full hour i really enjoyed it uh, as you rightly said sabka number aata hai hamara number aa gaya hai thank you for this wonderful conversation thank you thank you so much namaskar namaskar thank you, namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you.